Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. So um, just going to run through a few things before we get started with our pres uh, presenters. Um, so thanks for joining us today. Uh, Ask an Expert is a webinar series created by Team Grow NL and Connector NL with the St. John's Board of Trade. Uh, so my name is Tanya Heath. I'm with Team Grow NL. Um, we uh, are an initiative that aims to help local businesses meet their human resources needs by providing key information regarding immigration and the attraction of expatriate Newfoundlander and Labradorians living abroad. So on, uh, on the call today as well is our Connector NL team. So it's Shanna Monkford and Ashley Burge. Um, Connector NL is a program that helps individuals that are new to the provincial workforce grow their professional network and connect with career opportunities here in the province. So what this series does, it allows industry experts and employers gauge with job seekers that are interested in working in various sectors of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the aquaculture industry and we have with us Mark Lane and Sheldon George and I'm just going to take one moment to tell you a little bit about them. So Mark has lived in Holyrood, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador since 1982. He holds a Bachelor of Science from Memorial University, an Advanced Aquaculture Diploma from the Fisheries and Marine Institute, and an Applied Business Information Technology Graduate Diploma from College of the North Atlantic. His work experience includes 20 plus military, 20 plus year military career as a commissioned officer in the Canadian Forces, an owner operator of several small businesses, and he is presently employed as the executive director of the Newfoundland and Labrador Aquaculture Industry Association. And that is a member based organization with a mandate to facilitate and promote commercial development of aquaculture. Uh, moving on to Sheldon, uh, he was born and raised in Carbonier, Newfoundland and Labrador, and graduated from more from Memorial University with a Bachelor of Science degree majoring in biology. After achieving a Bachelor of Science, he continued his education at, Marine in, at the Marine Institute to complete the Advanced Diploma in Aquaculture in 97-98 and started his work in the aquaculture industry in New Brunswick. Um, after almost 10 years in New Brunswick, Sheldon returned to Newfoundland, continuing work in the aquaculture industry. And just after returning while working in the industry, he completed his Master of Technology Management in Aquaculture at the Marine Institute and is currently the Newfoundland Regional Manager for Cook Aquaculture. Their mission is to be a global seafood leader driven by an innovative team that delivers superior products, service, and value to customers in a safe and environmentally sustainable manner. So thank you both, uh, Mark and Sheldon, for being here today. Um, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from your presentations. We have some very interesting participants waiting. Um, so how this session will work now is Mark and Sheldon will present for about 10 to 15 minutes each, and then I'm going to pass it off to Shanna, and she will take you through a question and answer period. So feel free to type your uh, questions into the chat box during the presentations, and we'll address them afterwards in this period. Um, so. That's it for me, so let's get started with Mark. Well, thank you so much, guys, for the opportunity. It's a, certainly an honor. I'm very passionate about aquaculture and what it brings to not just the province of Newfoundland and Labrador and the rural communities that we operate in, but certainly to the world. We've got a, we've got a great responsibility as sustainable seafood farmers. We've got to feed a lot of people, and in doing so, we create a lot of economic business opportunities here at home in Newfoundland and Labrador. If it's okay with you, uh, I'd like to actually start with a quick little video and it kind of sets the scene of what we'd like to have a discussion about today. So just bear with me for a moment. I'll share my screen. And uh, just bear with me. Okay, hopefully you can see this. Are we, can we see this? <laughs> my disorganized desktop. And what I'd like to do is just a quick minute, three minute video, and uh, then I'll get into my presentation. Some people want to live in New York, some people probably in Montreal. You know what? San Diego. I love it here. It's so quiet, peaceful. Living in Harrow Breton is a way of life. People who are from rural communities like to stay in rural communities. There's a lot of beauty that we don't see every day. It's the Atlantic Ocean. It's pristine waters. Cold, clean waters of Newfoundland is what makes the, the area around here a great spot for farming. This is the best news story. It was sort of the overpass, it's down here. 
prime salmon is a heavily regulated industry, and you know with prime salmon that you're getting a quality, fresh, prime product. It's more natural to, to free swimming. Prime salmon is grown in deep, cold water, really well filtered, especially off of Newfoundland. We have a lot of current that keeps everything nice and clean. I remember the moratorium. I remember uh, a lot of sad faces around, a lot of uh, people wondering what they were going to do next because the fish plant had closed down. That was the biggest employer. People were devastated. They were losing their homes and their cars. When you are in your late 50s and you've worked all your life and you've got to move away just to try to keep from losing everything you've got after 40 years of employment, it was heartbreaking. Since agriculture moved in, this town has changed dramatically. I think it's a godsend to this community. Not only to this community, but for most of the Southwest Coast. Everyone that lives here, they see a lot of uh, spin offs that the industry brings. The restaurants and, and the hotels are busy. The amenities and services that are here are here because of the industry. I don't know what would have happened to some of these communities had the agriculture not come on street. I always say it's all about the fish, but it's also about the staff that works on the farms as well. You really had to see aquaculture to appreciate it. You know, you had to see the positive effects that it has on the local community. You had to see all the people who are employed by aquaculture and just even see, you know, all the practices that are in place to ensure environmental sustainability. There's, there's a lot more than what you read on the news when it comes to aquaculture. Farming is a 365 day a year job, so you're, you're with your co-workers every day of the year. They become your family, your, your farming family. There's no better sense of feeling than seeing a nice fillet of salmon on, on a shelf or on someone's plate, knowing that people on the farms took pride in producing that product. So as you can see from the video, it's, uh, I just want to give everybody an idea of, uh, bear with me, I'm going to cancel this. Oh. Okay. Yeah, so, all right, so we're still here, so we can still see live. What I do now, if I may, is start a little quick presentation. It's a number of slides, but it's, I think it's important. From the video, you, you did get a glimpse of some of the different uh, occupations that are available in our industry. As I said before, uh, before we actually got started, uh, there's a number of occupations throughout the entire value chain. And currently we have more than 100, upwards of 150 um, uh, job openings right now in Atlantic Canada. So what I'd like to do is just take you through a few slides, if I may. Can you see that? All right, perfect. And so, you know, when I first started, I alluded to the responsibility we have as seafood farmers. And if you look at this, I just want to put things into a, a global context of why aquaculture is important and how you as people who may be interested in working in or operating businesses in, you know, what you're contributing to. And so if you look at the world's population, you look at 9.1 billion, upwards of 10 billion people on the planet by 2050, which is certainly 70% or what the FAO of the United Nations predicts to be 70% beyond today's level. And so we need to produce more food. And so the amount of food that will be consumed in the next 50 years will exceed all that that has been eaten since the beginning of humankind. And th that's, that's astonishing to see that fact. And that's not coming from me, it comes from the United Nations. And again, so our, food, our world food supply needs to double by 2050. And of course, then the demand for animal protein uh, in correlation with the consumption and a rise in the human population will rise by nearly 73%. And so if you look at then the status of seafood, and as we all know, seafood is becoming more trendy. A lot, you know, people are looking at eating healthier. People want to live longer. They look at the health benefits of eating salmon or eating mussels or seafood, wild capture or aquaculture. But there's been a, tremend a tremendous uh, pressure upon the wild capture fisheries. And so for the first time uh, in 2019, you see that now that more than 50%, upwards actually now of 60% in some, in some uh, sources, 
of all seafood consumed is farmed. A lot of people don't know the seafood they're eating is farmed, but it is. And if you look at farmed seafood in comparison to, to other sources, certainly you can look at the traceability. So if you're someone like me who's a foodie, I like to know about my food. And if it's farmed, either on land or in the ocean, in our case it's an aquaculture, it certainly you can trace it back to its origin. And so we all know this gentleman, uh, who's the former United Nations Secretary Kofi Annan, and he saw, uh, before he, in his passing and in his role with the United Nations, he saw the necessity for food and what, what, how aquaculture can play a role. So there's a lot of misinformation out there. I kind of just want to talk and take a couple of moments to talk about sustainability and specifically salmon, of course, and I'll get into the other species in a moment. But if you look at Atlantic salmon specifically, uh, to produce 17.5 billion meals of salmon per year, you see in the top hand right of your screen, we use only 0.00008% of the world's ocean, or approximately you know, 300 square kilometers. But that's to feed 700 or 17.5 billion meals of sustainably farmed salmon each year. And if you look to the bottom right, if you look at space versus result, you know, and this is not, you know, any condemnation of any type of other farming activity, this is what it is. You know, uh, I see aquaculture as a solution or a potential solution to climate change. But if you look at, for example, one, milli one million kilograms of beef takes around 3,000, requires around 3,500 kilometers or sorry, hectares of pasture. And to produce the same amount of salmon requires only 1.6 hectares. So it's a significant amount. Yes, and of course we farm in the ocean, but the main thing is we farm vertically. And so again, you know, very busy slide, but if you look to the bottom right, what's important here again in terms of sustainability, because I, I pride myself in working in the most sustainable food production industry on the planet. As I said, there's a lot of misinformation out there, but if you look in terms of uh, water usage, you know, you have 15,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of beef, which is astonishing. You know, it's the same amount of rice, so for a kilogram of rice, it takes 3,500 liters of water, and for a salmon, it's, it's 900 liters, and that's mostly the space of which they occupy. If you look at food conversion, so how much feed does it take to actually produce a kilogram of flesh or a kilogram of protein? One kilogram of feed produces a kilogram of salmon, two for that of chicken, and then 10 kilograms required for beef. So again, I just want to showcase the actual sustainability of the industry. And again, if you look at, uh, if you want a good reference point, if you look, if you Google TEDx, uh, Dr. Steve Gaines, he's the environmental or the dean of the environmental science department from the University of California in San Diego. Him and his team calculated the average impact per pound of protein and farm seafood, uh, you know, salmon, mussels in particular, pr uh, you know, they, pr they produce a high amount of protein with the lowest carbon footprint. And so again, as I mentioned, 17 and a half billion meals per year, but we're here today to talk more about jobs. So around the globe, just in salmon farming, we're producing somewhere between 50 and 60,000 direct jobs on farms. And with that, then there's 80,000, uh, 80,600 indirect jobs. In Newfoundland and Labrador, through our stats and through Canada, for every direct job that's you know, uh, offered on a farm or available to uh, on a farm site, the spin-off of that or the indirect or induced jobs from that one job on a farm is about three to four throughout the value chain. And so for those of you who may not have visited a salmon farm, this is a typical salmon farm on the south coast. It might even be one of Sheldon's, I think. Uh, from that then, you produce a beautiful steak, salmon steak, which we all enjoy. I never had my lunch, so I'm getting hungry just looking at this. Maybe that's what I'll have for dinner tonight. And then from a traditional looking mussel farm, we produce uh, Canada's and the world's first organic blue mussel. So let's talk a little bit about Newfoundland and aquaculture. So, you know, aquaculture exists in almost, every, well, exists in every province actually in Canada, um, surprisingly enough, and even in the territories. But in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, we have two main focus areas where we produce. So if you look at the map to the left, uh, blue representing shellfish, so mussels and oysters, etc. And then on the south, uh, again, red would predominantly be salmon production and trout production. However, if you look to the north and you look to the west, you look at these other regions, they're hatcheries. And people say, well, why would you put your hatcheries so far away? We do have a hatchery uh, owned by Cook on the south coast. But on the, on the western side of Newfoundland and Labrador, 
A lot of it has to do with water supply, fresh water supply for the land-based component, component of production. And so predominantly you'll see Conagra Peninsula, Fortune Bay, those areas is finfish or salmon and some trout, and on the north coast, mussels. And if you look to the right, you'll see uh, this is a proposed area for a new venture into Placentia Bay operated by Greek Seafoods. So we're, we're expanding as, as time proceeds. So what does that mean in Newfoundland and Labrador in terms of jobs and total economic activity? So if you look at your screen, you see nearly a billion dollars in 2018, total economic activity, uh, which contributed almost 400 million to the gross domestic product, $204 million in wages, and 3,552 person years of employment. Basically what that is, it's statistics that shows how many job, full-time jobs are uh, available. And I might add that most of the jobs in aquaculture are full-time and year-round. So what is the potential then? So if you look at Newfoundland and Labrador, we have around 17,000 kilometers of coastline and we're producing roughly anywhere between 15 to 25,000 tons of seafood. Look at Norway and it's not an exact comparison, but in Norway, they're producing with a similar coastline. So they have about 25,000 kilometers of coastline. They're producing 1.2 million tons worth 10 billion. And so why I use this slide is just to show the potential. It's not comparing exactly apples to apples, but it is a, it is a good comparison. And it does illustrate and exhibit the potential that we have here to avail of this industry in this province. So let's talk about, you know, we hear a lot on the radio and in, in the news media as of late uh, of industries challenged by COVID, uh, by, you know, the global markets, et cetera. You know, two of the, two of the largest construction projects currently in Newfoundland and Labrador, uh, one is uh, run by uh, Greek Seafoods. So if you've been to Marystown, you're from the area, you might have seen it. I think it's 350, 400 people employed down there now. Uh, in the construction phase, that's a $75 million private investment into that town. And of course, you'll see with Moe, another salmon farming company, the largest in the world from Norwegian in origin, they're uh, actually now conducting in a $60 million construction project in a Stephenville. And Cook, if you see from your slide, they now have a $220 million capital works expenditure plan over the next five years. And the pictures you see in front of you, that's Ballorum. That's a cleaner fish. We can get into that a little later if we may in Q&A. Why do you have lumpfish? We don't farm those to eat. We farm them as a bi biological pest control. But again, as I mentioned, Moe, $60, $65 million investment in Stephenville and in the Greek Seafood Project in Marystown, um, you know, $75 million. So as I mentioned earlier, so from every job that's created on a farm, uh, typically, you know, three to four ratio is produced indirectly or induced. This slide, albeit very busy, shows some of those jobs. So everything from farm sites, fish health, working traditional processing, transportation, hatcheries, hospitality, skills and training, industry. And then from each of those, then you have a full suite of occupations that uh, can be uh, offered to those, to those of you who are on the call today. For that one. Some of the companies, so I've mentioned Cook, Moe, Grieg, Ocean Trout, and of course, you have Gale Force Group, Styro, or Newfoundland Styro, Aqua Group, Spreading, Aqualine, Poseidon. There's a, there's a ton of companies operating in Newfoundland. This is just a snapshot. And this slide focuses on, on the salmon, but we cannot forget mussels and, of course, oysters. And there's people now looking at urchins and seaweed as well. So it's not, we just don't farm salmon, we farm multi species. If you look at the opportunities to grow, there's business opportunities, there's business in terms of employment throughout the entire value chain. And this slide then focuses on the opportunities throughout the supply chain beyond, for example, beyond the um, uh, harvest. Again, another opportunity for people who may be interested in the Marystown region, uh, Marbase, which is a proposed um, service supply uh, center for the aquaculture industry in the Marystown region. Uh, Jim uh, from the Swanger Cove Hatchery in St. Albans. And I'll just click through these pictures quite quickly just to give you an idea of some of the jobs. You'll see the happy grin on people's faces like Jim. These people are happy. And I always tell people in aquaculture, we provide people um, to do what they love to do in a place they love to live. And it's hard to create employment sometimes in rural coastal communities, uh, but that's what we do. And we're quite proud that we do it that way. So we've got Jim, we've got the guys there in Swanger's Cove, 
and again, you'll see young, older people, men, women, First Nations. It's very important. We're very inclusive and a very diverse workforce as well. Everybody's showing their grins. Everybody's happy. And of course, you look at this, this would actually be a feed barge on one of our sites. So, uh, you know, quite innovative, quite technologically uh, advanced, our industry is. As I mentioned, youth, our young people. Traditional uh, processing. If you like the outdoors and driving boats like I do, you'll love it. Veterinary, scientists. Uh, Steve Crew, one of our biggest ambassadors in the province. And as you saw in the video, you know, aquaculture is the best news story outside the overpass. And a lot of that, you know, can go back around to jobs and employment opportunities that this industry is creating for people here at home. And of course, we've got the support of municipalities and we've got the support of the people. 62% of people right across this province fully support the industry. It's around 30% undecided and a small fraction of ideolog ideological people who, who don't understand or don't want to understand. Uh, but, you know, this is a great opportunity for Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. It's a great opportunity for immigrants as well to come here and to work in the most sustainable industry or food production industry in the world. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's 100 openings. And this is my last slide, by the way, I think. Uh, there's a lot of current openings that we're actually finding a, a challenge to fill. And so, you know, you can reach out to the association. You can go to the NIA website, naia.ca, and look at our members. Uh, but some of the jobs you're looking at, administrative support, uh, human resources director, which I think can be based anywhere. So it's not just on the south co co uh, coast or north coast. Uh, harvest vessel deckhands, engineers, hatchery managers, etc. I'm not going to read all that to, to you. All you fine people can read that yourself. But this illustrates there's a, over 100 openings in just one company in Atlantic Canada. And I think that would be my last slide. And if it's not, I'm going to stop there anyway. My wife always says, Mark, you got two ears and one mouth, and you need to learn how to use them appropriately, or at least uh, in, in perspective. So I'll, I'll end on that note. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, so much, Mark, for that presentation. Uh, it was very, very informative. Um, I, we're just going to go right into Sheldon's, Sheldon's presentation now. Um, so, Sheldon, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks uh, for the invite for to have this ability to promote our industry. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, who's joined us today. Uh, I'm just going to show a quick video of uh, what probably not many of you know what a day in the life of a fish farmer entails. So uh, one, one of the resources that we had for our company to recruit people is to, to have a video to, so people will know what, what's involved in working on a farm and they, to try to get people interested in, in working in the industry. I just got to uh, share my screen. Hold on for a sec. My name is Ron Muncy. I work at Sealy's Cove. Just starting the boat up. It's 6.30 a.m. We'll work normally until 8.30 or 9 o'clock as long as we can until dark. Just did the boat checklist. Got my equipment all turned on. Just heading out to the site. My name's Jason. We're in Sealy's Cove, which is southwestern New Brunswick. And we're aboard the KCS Jupiter. We have eight 150-meter cages on site. They're approximately 70 feet deep and approximately 100,000 fish per cage. Every cage has an underwater camera, which you can see here. It's around the clock, it has capabilities of delivering our feed, fuel, and water. If the weather is bad, we can monitor these from shore. Just getting here to our feed barge, I'm going to check in with Jason inside, see if we're doing net changes. Uh, more dives, lice counts, things like that. These are fairly new barges. Uh, they hold close to 300 ton of feed. They can be remote fed from inshore for storm days. Inside is fully equipped with a full kitchen, washroom, all the comforts we need for a long day of work. We just pulled up to the cage here. We noticed the fish are swimming on top. The sensor's inside with the real-time aqua. They say the oxygen levels are fine. We have the traditional YSIs that we're going to double check just for safety purposes. 
If the oxygen was low, you have to monitor it every hour. You just don't want them to uh, begin feeding and all their metabolism boost up because then they won't be able to replenish all their oxygen levels fast enough. All right, today we're doing a weekly light count. We count five fish out of six cages, just so we know whether we have to treat again or not. So this is uh, mandatory to the government. We have to do this weekly, and the numbers go to them and our vets. Part of our daily checklist is we walk the cages each day looking for broken plastics. For knots, we have three handrail ties that are holding up both the main net and the top net. We have to make sure they're all snug and secure. Our other lines we have to check is out on the bird stand, out in the center of the cage, you have your bird stand lines here. So we're going to go get the divers right now. They're going to do a more dive in the cages and a net inspection. Next week we will be doing a grid inspection. We're here with the divers now. We're about to do our mort dive. Two divers will be going down in the cage. It's protocol for the company. Uh, while they're down there, they will get the mortalities, the dead salmon, and at the same time, they will check for holes in nets and loose ties. I'm Mark Fraser, the remote feed supervisor for New Brunswick. We're here in Blacks Harbor uh, remote feed office where we feed five sites currently. And here's two of our sites here, Bancroft Point and Davidson Head. Some of the benefits are uh, you, get to, you can free up the staff out on site uh, to do maintenance, um, take care of the health of the fish and things like that. It's rough out on the site, we can still log in and uh, run the system and we can feed straight from here. We don't have to worry about sailing out on boats and uh, endangering the crew and things like that. They see we can we can feed uh, four cages at the same time. We're able to pan around and zoom into a particular cage to make sure that we're actually getting a proper spread and the feed is actually going into the cage. It's good to keep an eye on the farm from here to make sure there's no storm damage. Uh, make sure your pipes are all connected. My name is Chris. I work as a weight sampling technician for Kelly Cove Salmon at the Saltwater Office in Blacks Harbor. We take pictures of all the fish inside each cage at a farm, and once we bring that back to the office, we actually size them on a computer program, and this allows us to get an average weight of the fish that are in each cage at any given farm. Here at Kelly Cove Salmon, we have three weight sampling technicians, and we cover all the farms in Maine, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Graham the safety is obviously a number one priority of Cook. And they're always looking for ways to become safer. And there's always people around to show you what's going on, train you, or assist you with anything you need. Cook is a large company that has plenty of opportunity to advance. I started a year ago with Kelly Cove Salmon on the farm, out on the saltwater site, and within a year I was promoted to the weight sampling technician, and I've been really loving it. It's nice to be in the office as well as get out still on the water. Every day is different, it's always changing, there's something new. Start your day early, see the sunrise, and there's always sea life and lots going on. It's a great environment to work in. Well, that's, uh, that's what the life of a fish farmer looks like in, in the run of a day. And uh, as Mark alluded to, uh, there's lots of job openings in, in Atlantic Canada. I think as a company in a whole in Atlantic Canada, Cook Aquaculture has about 100 job openings right now. Uh, and they range from uh, site technicians, vessel captains, vessel deckhands, marine mechanics, divers, and so on. So it's a uh, it's a variety of uh, skill sets that we need. Uh, it's not just uh, the science base of uh, the biology of grown fish, but also the, the skills of mechanics and welders and everything like that of broad spectrum. So uh, we, we got openings for everyone. I don't know uh, if, if we'll have a question, a question session, I guess, at the end, but uh, that'll be my, uh, my spiel for now. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sheldon, for um, showing that video um, and going through some of the, the open positions. Over 100 positions, that is 
wild. <laughs> um, so right now we're going to go to the question and answer period. Uh, I'm going to pass things off to Shanna now. So we, I think we have one question ready to go in the chat box, but if you, if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to um, write it, write it down in that box and we will make sure to um, ask Mark and Sheldon. So Shanna? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, and thank you, Sheldon, and thank you, Mark. It was a very, very um, interesting presentation. I always thought this is the third Ask an Expert we've done, and I'm always like, I want to work in that industry after I hear the presentation. So there's, there's so much interesting stuff happening in our province, so it's really, really exciting. Um, so, yes, if anyone has any questions, like we said, in the chat section down below at the bottom of the screen is where you can put that. And the first question that we have is about cod farming. So what is the prospect for this province's Atlantic cod farming or probably a capture-based cod ranching model of fish production? So whichever one of you would like to take that first. I'm go ahead, Charles. Yeah, you can go right ahead, Mark. <laughs> right, so currently we have two licensed operators in the province for cod ranching. So for those of you who may not know, that involves the capture of wild stock. Uh, that are for, you know caught in the traditional cod trap, brought into a central farm uh, inland or in the ocean, but in a harbor, and then fed frozen capelin until the till the market uh, dictates. Usually in the fall. So if you look at, for example, um, uh, Gooseberry Cove, which operated out in Trinity Bay for a number of years, their cod was actually featured at Walt Disney World and at the restaurant at the top of the CN Tower. And because of the quality, so what they did, they captured it, they fed it frozen capelin. Two advantages was, was the method of harvest. So, you know, the, the amount of time from when they actually slaughtered the animal till it made to market was quicker. And from the study that we did, and we did actually did an economic analysis of this and visited cod farms in Greenland, in Maniatsa, Greenland, as well as up in Harstad, 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, where this is uh, really taken off, um, you know, traditionally for a head-on gutted, so fish without the, the entails, we'll save. So for a traditional wild cod, cod, you'd get around 67 cents. And for a cod that's ranched and then farmed and fed until the off season, it's upwards of $3.25 US per pound. So the return for the farmer was exceptional. Now from egg to plate, we'll say using the hatchery, as we do for salmon, uh, I noticed recently there's been some major investments in Norway uh, for that. The issue, I guess, that we have globally, uh, well, not an issue, I guess, there's an ample supply of codfish and whitefish on the market. So I think, you know, when you're looking at what you're farming, you have to look at the availability of what's available, you know, in terms of wild cod or wild capture. I think Iceland's producing around 160,000, somewhere between 160,000, 200,000 tons. I think Norway and Russia are harvesting from the wild somewhere around a half a million tons. And so the prospects of farming uh, in a large scale for codfish, you know, in my own personal opinion, uh, you know, as wild stocks decline, as they did with other species, so farming will increase. Uh, but right now, I think it's more of an artisanal, artisanal uh, fishery or artisanal you know, a niche market, we'll say. So very small uh, and limited amounts, but those who have done it in the province have been quite successful. And I'm a believer, if you look at, again, the methods, if you look at Maniatsuk, uh, Greenland, and you know, we've, we visited Royal Greenland site there, what they do, they've partnered with wild capture fisheries people, and they come and pick up the codfish live using a former, formerly used salmon aquaculture type well boat and then they bring it to the plants and they they store it on site and they harvest it up on demand and from the time they harvest the codfish until the time it's in a box and going to market it's approximately 90 minutes and so the quality of that fish has been phenomenal and i've tasted it firsthand so long story made shorter uh, i'll wrap up the, the answer there there's a i think there's a big potential for it it's just at this particular point in time i think large scale large scale cod fishery 
uh, may be done or cod ranching, sorry, or cod farming. Um, you know, I think we're in the infancy stages of them. Oh, I think Shani, you're on mute. Sorry. Sheldon, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, Mark. Uh, Mark done a good summary on the cod farming and ranching. Uh, just from a from an industry perspective, it's it's hard to grow something when it's uh, easily available in the wild, like with the wild fisheries that we have. So uh, it's hard to to compete with the wild prices. But uh, but like with sal salmon farming, uh, wild salmon is very scarce. So that, that's why we're able to make a go of salmon and trout farming. Uh, Maybe in a few years, if, if something unfortunate happens and the cod fishery uh, gets more scarce again, uh, you'll see probably the, the ranching and farming come back up in cod, in, in my view. So. Okay. Excellent. So the next question is, are all of the sites open pens or are there any house-based sites? I guess that's open for both as well. Uh, Sheldon, you could talk from a cook uh, perspective and mark uh, from an industry wide. <laughs> okay, yeah, for for Cook uh, in Atlantic Canada, not just Newfoundland, uh, all of our all of our farms are open pen closed containment. But uh, I, I think they're probably asking, is there any living accommodations on the farms? Or I'm not sure about the house part on on the question. So, uh, but the, yeah, they're all uh, closed containment uh, net net pen uh, farms. I think from an industry, if I may, Sheldon, jump in. So, you know, we'll take it and we'll, we'll answer that question in two ways without knowing the exact question. So in terms of if it's living accommodations, they're asking about, yes, there's, there's living accommodations on some of the farms in other companies. You know, I, I, I talk to, when I talk to people, they say, what are they like? They're like floating hotels. One of the newest barges uh, actually owned by Moe uh, now has a sauna. Uh, for example, a weight room, individual bedrooms is my understanding. I haven't had the opportunity to visit, but it's a nice, and they use the living accommodations because it's so far removed uh, and so remote out around the area, you know, bay, west of Bay the View, or sorry, east of Bay the View. Uh, and in the day-to-day -day offices that people have in all companies, uh, I think Sheldon, you would agree, uh, are phenomenal, right? As you saw in the video or you saw in the show photos that I shared, you know, when you go to a site, you know, you, you can take off your shoes, you can go inside, you know, you're monitoring fish and feeding fish through a camera, or you can feed them remotely. You can, you, can, you know, in some instances, you can feed from a phone or feed from land. Uh, I'll jump over to the land-based component, if that's what they were speaking about, in, in versus, you know, and I'm not a big fan of the ocean, open, what is it, open pen net farming. We're open ocean, and we're closed pen. So our pens are closed, top, bottom, left, right, and center. Uh, and so, yes, all the companies and you know, Sheldon can certainly elaborate on what Cook does, but all the companies have both land-based components, some of which are state-of-the-art anywhere in the world. And then what they do, you know, if you take and break it down to the life cycle of a salmon, and, and maybe Sheldon, you can jump in, uh, you know, 18 months, the first half of every salmon that's farmed to adult size spends the first half of their life on land in a hatchery. And the reason they're moved to the ocean is because biologically that's what they require. And so that's what we do. We try to mimic that as best we can, but nowhere in Newfoundland is there a full, well, nowhere commercially in Newfoundland, there may be a, you know, that memorial or some science, uh, you know, at the Marine Institute or something, but there's nowhere commercially uh, in uh, Newfoundland where they grow salmon from egg to plate on land, but all companies that grow salmon in this province, do have both components. And, and the, the trend is now, is, it used to be kind of half and half, land base and, and, and seed. But uh, as we try to grow our smoke bigger now, uh, it's shortening the time that they're in, in the salt water, in the open ocean. So I think you'll see a trend where it's, it's becoming probably 60-40, where 60% 60 of the growth is done on land, 40% is in the ocean because of the bigger small trends. And if you look at the jobs, then, you know, if you look at, in terms of what, you know, why we're here today, the jobs. So for example, you know, Cook has uh, a facility in Daniels Harbor on the Northern Peninsula. They've got a hatchery in Swangers Cove and St. Albans. 
and writes for the value chain, right? So then you've got Moe, who has their hatchery in Stephenville. You've got Grieg operating in, in um, Pazentia Bay. You've got the mussel farmers on the North Coast. So you could be from anywhere. And as I said earlier, we enable people to do what they love to do in a place they love to live, which is typically your hometown. You know, most of us want to live, you know, at least in, in Newfoundland and Labrador, and particularly in our hometown if we can. And that's the opportunity that we, we provide. And we provide that, you know, in many, many rural coastal communities from coast to coast to coast in the province. And we can do that on land in some instances or on the ocean in others. Or you can be like I am, based in St. John's, living in Holderbury. Excellent. So we have a couple of career-based questions here now. So the first one is from a marine environmental technology student in the third year at the Marine Institute. Um, and she would like to work in the aquaculture industry, uh, particularly in mussel farming. So do either of you have any advice on how someone uh, could secure a work term and or future employment within the industry? Send me an email. <laughs> so, you know, you can share my, and I, and I say that jokingly, but, but not, not necessarily jokingly. Uh, please share my contact with everybody on the call and I can point them in the right direction where I think they could, you know, advance themselves or, um, uh, um, you know, move into an industry position. You know, if you, when you read our bios, both Sheldon and I are proud alumni of Memorial and the Marine Institute. We both did biology and we both did the advanced diploma at the Marine Institute at, at Memorial. And, you know, that's a first step. If you want, if you want to, uh, you know, proceed with a post-secondary education at Memorial. But there's also community-based education, which we offer in partnership with the Marine Institute, for example, where we can offer training in situ in the communities where you live. And, you know, there's a technical certificate in aquaculture, there's a certificate in aquaculture management, and so those sort of things. But I think the number one, um, and I think that person uh, had just done that, I think the number one you know, or the most uh, important step that anybody could take to get involved in the industry is to tell people that I want to work in aquaculture, to reach out to the industry association, to reach out to our members, to, to actually, you know, um, to learn more firsthand. And there are jobs in muscle. You know, we, we focused a lot on salmon aquaculture, and I'll show a quick video toward the end if we have time. Uh, but, you know, we've got several major muscle operations in the province, uh, in the Botwood area, in the Triton area, and then the Conagra Peninsula as well. And there's opportunity to grow more. And so I, th I think, you know, education is key, but I think the, the most important step is to reach out to people like myself and Sheldon and others who work in industry uh, to get an understanding of what we do day to day and to make that relationship so that they, they, you know, that they, they can proceed with an application. And I always, uh, is, I think the uh, advanced diploma in aquaculture class, or I'm not sure what the new title of the course is now, but I think the, the class is listening there in, in Marine Institute. But for all students, uh, I always uh, recommend uh, w when you start work in the industry, education is great. Uh, I always, uh, the president of MUN was out here a couple of weeks ago and I listed off the education that I have. And she was like, why, why do you always continue with education and uh, I say well it, it don't cost anything to carry around it opens up your opportunities but with all the education you have to have good work ethic committed to your job and be in it for the long run and uh, you have to start at the bottom and work your way up through everywhere so it's great to commit a commit to schools I don't want to discourage anyone uh, Come out of a school with, with education, but don't expect to be in a top management job on your first two two weeks of, the, of getting into the industry. So uh, I started out uh, feeding fish by hand and working on sites and, and on harvest boats. But work your way up through, experience every, every area in the industry in, with the company so that you can learn how everything operates and that'll help you further develop and advance in your careers. Excellent. Okay, now there's another question uh, about working in the industry. So rural areas are beautiful and relaxing, 
but are there any challenges that workers are confronted with by living and working in rural areas? I guess that would be Mark. You're not in a rural area. Holy Road is Holy pretty, is pretty rural, but you're <laughs> more rural for sure. Go ahead, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it, there, there are some uh, challenges uh, living kind of in rural areas. Uh, you don't always have the amenities of people like Mark and Holy Road can just drive for half an hour and get to a Costco or or whatever. Uh, but but you make uh, you make adjustments to your lifestyle and uh, you you plan around that and uh, you make the best of the rural life. There may be some disadvantages of living in rural areas that you don't have in urban centers, but there's a lot more advantages I think to living in the rural areas. Like uh, last night, for example, I had a I think it was eight or nine people at my house. We were out, sat down to a fire in the backyard, quiet as can be. Uh, just uh, enjoying the enjoying the outdoors here. Uh, I think it would be hard pressed to do that in in downtown St. John's. So it's uh, it's uh, for me uh, the benefits far away the the inconveniences of rural life. Absolutely, it's you know rural. You Mark, you had also mentioned. Um, Marystown. So I'm a little biased because my family is from the Buren Peninsula and you like the South Coast and like the Buren Peninsula. It's so beautiful. It's just so <laughs> stunning and so underrepresented in tourism. So <laughs> it's, I agree. yeah. All right. Now, one second. I just lost my last question. Oh, um, so someone else asked, uh, is there any sort of partnership with the Marine Institute where graduate students are sourced to fill the job vacancies that exist in the aquaculture con industry? Shall not let you take that. <laughs> uh, there's no, uh, I think I've seen the question pop up, they call it like, it, is there a handshake or whatever? Uh, there's no, uh, we, we have no agreements with the Marine Institute or, or any, any uh, school that, that we, we have to take anyone. But uh, where we have probably eight or 10 uh, Marine Institute students working with us in, in various roles in the company in Newfoundland, we, uh, we have a strong alumni and, and an affiliation with the Marine Institute that I always, I always put myself in the students' shoes, uh, being there myself. And uh, I like to try to give the students a, a crack at a job if we got one. So. Uh, it's always try to give back to the school that, that got us where we are today. And we're, we're always doing research with the MON and the Marine Institute. We're always in communication with each other. And uh, we usually do try to fulfill uh, any work terms if, if the people are interested in coming this way. Excellent. Not sure uh, if that, that fully answers it or no, but. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, think it, I think it certainly does. There's no, no official pathway yeah. but you you still try to source locally which is kind of ties in um so there are some questions about uh how COVID-19 and how the pandemic has affected hiring and supply chain so how how has COVID-19 affected the industry I'll just uh, go first here Mark yeah, <laughs> In the markets, it, it has negatively affected uh, somewhat the markets. There was a shift. Uh, one of the first things to close down was the was the restaurant business, and, and that was a big uh, big part of the markets. But as uh, as the market changed, and, and now we're selling more more product to the grocery stores for people to cook at home, the, the market is rebounding a little bit, and. Uh, COVID, uh, not in the supply chain, it had an effect, but uh, also in in the human resources, there was a bit of an effect. Uh, it was uh, a lot of people were kind of, we're a class as an essential service, an essential industry workers. We had to go to work. We're, we're looking after live animals. Uh, not, uh, it was kind of nice to be classed the same as doctors and, and nurses, like, you know, with the, that's what we're doing to our fish, right? We're looking after them, keeping them healthy. So uh, it was hard to get some people to uh, to understand the fact that we were essential and that we had to go to work, and that that was one of the harder parts. Yeah, if I may just add, you know, look, 
there's no doubt that COVID-19 is a challenge. It's been a challenge to everybody in some aspect of our life or some aspect of our work for everybody on this call or globally for that matter. Uh, but as I said, I was asked this question just a couple of days ago and I said, you know what, as hardworking Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, we're always willing and, and ready to step up to the challenge. And we did that. And it was, it was, uh, you know, it, it was very evident uh, of the hard work and the skill and the teamwork, not just within companies, but between companies. You know, I get the absolute privilege to work with a number of companies in all aspects of the value chain. And I've never seen a level of collaboration and cooperation that I saw since the onset of COVID. You know, for example, we had daily or weekly call, daily calls with industry, but weekly calls with, you know, government officials and politicians and key decision makers and other stakeholders like municipalities, et cetera, that we never typically had. We, we, we just took it for granted potentially. But now we, I think, you know, someone said to me the other day, said, what does aquaculture look like post COVID? I said, well, I think to the outside, it'll look the same. But I think internally, you know, we've learned, um, you know, how to improvise, adapt, and overcome quite quickly, is which what we do as farmers. But I think we've also formed collaborative relationships and partnerships with people that we really didn't utilize or talk to as much as possible. And through things like this initiative with Zoom, I don't know if this ever would have happened, potentially, without COVID-19. So again... You know, it's, there's, there are benefits and there's no doubt it's been a hardship to many people throughout the world. But I think that, you know, outside of what Sheldon had alluded to, which, you know, salmon prices, markets, especially for shellfish, mussels and oysters and the restaurant biz, um, you know, our, our industry, we still hire. You know, we didn't lay people off. We were still hiring. We still went to work every day. We still fed fish, produced fish, harvest fish. So, you know, I think that's important. And I think a lot of that can be attributed to the hard work of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians and to the dedication to the companies. Excellent. Perfect. So that sort of answers a couple of questions that came through. It, when it comes to hiring and jobs available in the industry, it probably won't. Like the, the pandemic hasn't really negatively affected opportunities in the future. Not for employment, I don't think. No. Excellent. That, that's great to hear. I don't think. I know. <laughs> it, 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 it may make it harder to get a job because there may be more people applying for jobs now that in other industries, unfortunately, they, they, they weren't able to keep their jobs. So it's making a few more people available. That, that's an interesting point. Very smart. All right. So uh, in the interest of time, uh, so we can watch the video Mark had, there were a lot of questions I didn't get to. Would you mind if we sent you those questions that people had that we didn't get to um, for if you want to reach out to them to answer any sure. questions they had mm -hmm. I, I can definitely get you get you some of those but it's we're cutting it pretty close to the end so thank you to everyone who submitted a question it was uh, it's very full I was doing a lot of reading <laughs> listening at the same time um, so yes I'll I'll let you open up to that video mark uh, and mm -hmm. then Thank you again, Sheldon and Mark, for, for participating. Cool. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, I hope everyone learned a lot. For any students who are listening who just went back to school, I hope you have a fantastic semester and uh, that eventually you'll get back into the classrooms. <laughs> It'll be great. Okay, I'll just share my screen. And again, you know, please, anybody who has any questions, reach out to me anytime. I'm pretty easy to find uh, on Facebook, Twitter, I even prefer phone calls or Zoom, et cetera. I'm sure Sheldon will be the same. He, he's probably a bit more busy than what I am in, in a day-to-day -day in a different capacity, but uh, I'm always uh, open for, for conversation. So I will share my screen quite quickly. And if there's anyone in the university or, or Marine Institute, uh, your instructors, use, most of them got my contact information as well, so you can go through them. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Oh, it's not what I wanted to share. Just bear with me for one moment. I don't feel so bad now. <laughs> it's all good. Technology is excellent when it works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's another That's salmon good. video, but uh, we I was going to show the muscle video, but I'll show this one because a lot of people were asking about, you know, living and working in rural areas. And I think that you'll find... Uh, you know, one person in this video describes themselves as a townie living in the bay. So uh, this is only, this is a much shorter video. It's around one minute. So enjoy. 
I'm originally from St. John's, I'm Italian living in the Bay. I'm passionate about aquaculture because it's the sustainable means of producing protein and uh, it's something that we're going to need. Aquaculture was a chance for me to come back home, come back to the water and the prairies and, and this is what I want to be, I, I want to work around here. One of the main benefits of the aquaculture industry is that I get to stay in my hometown. I get to be where my parents are and where the rest of my family is. It brings people in. My husband and I are one example. We have a two-year-old, a dog, we have a house. We're here. We're here to stay. It's a new industry. The salmon hatchery is innovation. It's new technology. It's a new way to do business. Traceability is very important in aquaculture. We trace an egg right from the time that the fish has found it right up to market size. We trace them for size, feed, weight. Every little detail is traced. I trust it. I know where it's coming from. I know what it's being fed. So that makes a big difference for me. In around the industry now, you realize how important it is to the companies and the industry in general to take care of the environment. The environment is the most important piece of the puzzle and if we are look after the environment, the environment will look after us. We want to ensure that we're doing everything that we can to create this beautiful, delicious product that we can serve for our families and live in these rural areas where it's just stunning and we can see the stars. All that plays a, plays a big role in what sustainability actually means. Well, thank you. Oh, fear of me. Awesome. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining today. Thank you again, Sheldon and Mark. Um, great presentations. Um, I'm sure everyone learned a lot. I sure did. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for joining us. Um, we do have another Ask an Expert uh, webinar session coming up on October 21st. And that is aerospace and defense industry. So uh, we will have a representative from there um, joining us for that. So if you're interested, um, keep an eye out for that information. But until then, I will close this off by uh, just thanking you again. And have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.